Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we will begin in two minutes. Uh, welcome everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today from across varied time zones. Uh, I'm Samira Bose, and I'm Programs Coordinator at Asia Art Archive in India. Uh, for those of you who are not as familiar with our work, uh, we are an independent nonprofit organization, and we document and conduct research and programs on recent art and art histories from across Asia. Uh, our main office is based in Hong Kong, uh, where we have a reference library and the materials in our archive are digitized and available online for reference. We also have an office in New Delhi, where I'm currently speaking to you from. Uh, so one of the projects that we have been working on over the last year across Delhi, Hong Kong and Kathmandu is Mobile Library in Nepal. The project officially launched this month and it is a collaboration between Asia Art Archive and Siddhartha Arts Foundation and is generously supported by the Foundation for Arts Initiatives. Uh, it is a traveling library that circulates books on recent art from Asia within Nepal. And these books will be activated through a series of on-site and online programs with educators, arts universities, and independent arts organizations. So one of the most prominent conversations that we have been having as part of this project is actually about archiving. Uh, the specific limitations that we have in the region, but also kind of the proliferation of interest and initiatives in archiving in the field. And this, along with other discussions with colleagues across South Asia, is what led to Inter-Archives Conversations, uh, which is a platform for institutions and individuals working with archives in the South Asia region to kind of come together to share about the forms and infrastructures of their archives um, and how they're thinking about their work and how they want to situate their materials in context with the urgencies of the present. And we aren't defining South Asia in the sense of a strict geographical boundary, uh, but more as a way to think about certain shared affinities and histories that ground our concerns. Uh, so how can we share our materials and our processes with each other? How can we learn from each other? and also perhaps ask each other some critical questions. And as we prepare for the public program today, uh, we realize that the conversations we have in an informal capacity are also forging connections and collaborations to come. And so we think of these conversations in a much broader sense um, through public panel discussions, intensive closed door sessions and workshops, and also informal chats that we hope we can facilitate. So we will be having a set of four inter-archives conversations spread out over eight months, which will be organized in conjunction with the mobile library. And each of these will be a collaboration with an archive in Nepal. Uh, these conversations will be based on the key concerns and interests of the archive in question. And the session today has been co-curated with the Department of Art and Design at Kathmandu University, who are one of the key uh, partners for mobile library. So they have embedded archiving art history in Nepal as part of the pedagogy in their department, and they'll be sharing more about it with us today. Uh, the core concern that they have is about how students do not actually have easy access to primary and secondary materials around art, uh, because these are within personal collections and in limited circulation. So today we will be <clears throat> discussing how researchers and archivists encounter 
and are initiated into personal art archives and how these are brought into the public domain, formally through institutional, institu institutionalization and digitization or through artistic and curatorial modes. Uh, we will also be exploring what we can define as personal, uh, how we can be wary of the ways in which archives can canonize individuals and how our emphasis can instead be on making canons vulnerable and also attuning to the kind of broader milieus and histories that personal archives can reveal. I'm very happy to introduce our speakers for the program today. Uh, Sujan Chitrakar and Roshan Mishra will be presenting on the Department of Art and Design, Kathmandu University's work with the archive. Uh, Sujan Chitrakar is a formative educator in the department uh, who has been working to formalize the department's collection into a museum and archive of modern and contemporary art from Nepal. His artistic practice emphasizes bringing art into the public domain. Uh, Roshan Mishra is the director at Taragao Museum, and he also manages the Nepal Architecture Archive. In a personal capacity, he is working with the archive of his father, eminent Nepali artist Manoj Babu Mishra. Uh, we have also Sanina Iqbal, who is a practicing artist and art historian currently based in Lahore. And she is the associate professor in the Center for Media Studies, Art and Design at the Lahore School of Economics. She has been working as an independent researcher with the Salima Hashmi archive at AAA for the last three years, digitizing the archival materials the artist and artist, art educator has collected over several decades. And she will be sharing this ongoing process with us today. Uh, Simone Wahid is a visual artist, researcher, and art educator based in Dhaka and an assistant professor and doctoral candidate at the Department of Drawing and Painting, a Faculty of Fine Art, University of Dhaka. His research has been focused on the life's work and personal archive of the Bangladeshi pioneer modern artist, Zainul Abedin. And today he will be sharing how he has embedded the materials from Abedin's archive in his artistic and curatorial practice, and how he is working with Abedin's family to create access to the archive. We're very thankful to have you all with us here today. Um, just before we begin, some housekeeping. So this session will be for one and a half hours. Uh, the speakers will be presenting their work in the first 45 minutes, and then we will have a conversation and open up to questions from audiences at the end. If you have questions, please type them in the Zoom Q&A feature, and you can do this anytime in the talk, and we will do our best to take them up in the discussion. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to you, Sujan and Roshan. Shall I share the slides, Susan? Yeah, please. Yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Samira, for pulling this off. And it's been a wonderful gathering here. Uh, I want to share a brief about like what we uh, used to do in KU. Uh, when we started this department, uh, we started fairly normal, a, a very in a very uh, small scale, you know. And during our education, um, this uh, when we're teaching art history in Nepal, like we couldn't get any material that could be related in art, particularly in contemporary Nepali art. You know? So what we started to do was to send our students to artist studio and collect materials, and they would come back to school and share those materials with the fellow students and also make presentations and keep those materials in the library. So we've been running this format for quite long, but in uh, 2017, we had this like very uh, big flood in our school. And uh, this is the premises where uh, this space got in, inundated with this nearby river when it got swollen in, during the monsoon. You know? And our in the campus, our main uh, library was in the ground floor. So we lost nearly 50% of our books and we lost all the materials that we had collected for past like 12 to 13 years. You know? And uh, during that time, like I realized that you no, know, it was a big mistake for us to keep those materials intact in physical form only. So we had like talk with our team and then we started to offer a course called Research Documents and Archiving. This was the, these are the books that we, lost you know. 
and we invited Russian Mishra in the team as a team member, and we started giving this course called Research Documents and Archiving, and where we offer our students uh, to continue the course. And the students were supposed to go and collect materials, but this time we were doing and digitizing the materials and also keeping those materials as in a very uh, constructive format. So, Roshan, I request you to like go from here. Yeah. Thanks, Susan. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Samir. Um, just, uh, just to give you a little bit of background uh, on what Susan said. Um, you know, when we started the archive in 2017, we planned it in 2017, and then we started the course from 2018. But when it started at that point, uh, we had basically no materials. We started with uh, zero, you know, there was no materials at all. Uh, but the idea we had was, uh, was we thought it is going to be effective because we were uh, planning to support the students because the archiving process and the documentation process was important to them as well. Because as they came from the art background, you know, they will have their own materials to kind of document and archive. And somehow we thought that it is very important for the students to actually have the basic knowledge of documentation and archiving. Um, so, you know, after, after that, then we, we started to uh, kind of talk with students, uh, faculty members, and then we decided to kind of uh, uh, use the students to collect the materials and bring it to the university. And that will be managed in each semester and students will uh, manage those documents and make it accessible to the fa faculty members, as well as for the students, you know. So it, there was like three, um, uh, you know, groups of people who were actually benefiting uh, from this method. So obviously the students would benefit and then uh, the faculty members were definitely uh, you know, they will, they will uh, be able to look at those materials and access those materials. Uh, any other individuals who are related to art and culture and any other students and researchers would benefit. But the collection was very small. So now, now it's 2021 and we have about uh, 100, 150, uh, you know, folders of different Nepali artists and institutions. And it's... Uh, the idea was, you know, to basically just to focus on collecting materials. We were not thinking whether they were, you know, published material. We are not thinking whether they are lost, just unpublished material. We are not teaching them what to collect. We're just asking them, just go and collect the materials from different institutions, different artists, whatever they can give you or whatever they will provide, just bring it to the university. And that could be Xerox materials, that could be photographs, that could be digital files or folders, right? So initially, obviously, the, the, you know, the training and the support uh, was needed to manage the materials. And that is where I was engaging mainly with the Kathmandu University students. And uh, uh, the material collection was being done by the students and we were going through a process how we actually you know, uh, manage the materials. And the other thing, other, other challenge was the digitization. And this is also, we actually assigned the students to kind of digitize the materials and they were accessioning the materials and they were making it you know, available for the other students. So collection wise, as I said before, like we were not worried about any particular materials. We looked at the archival materials and we also looked at the non-archival materials as well. So the idea was to kind of collect all kinds of materials related to, you know, Nepali art, Nepali history, culture, tradition, and all that. So original materials, there were some coming, but most of the materials, what we were getting was Xerox and, you know, copies and catalogs and other type of materials. But having said that, if you, if you visit the Kathmandu University now, and then if you pull any of the folders or any of the documents of any of the artists, 
I think you will get sufficient materials where you will not be able to get anywhere else. So the idea was to just keep continue collecting the materials, you know, uh, in, uh, in the normal circumstances, you know, like the library have some sort of materials and archive will have the other sort of materials, you know, especially library will have the published material and archive is supposed to have the unpublished materials, but we are not worried about those sort of factor. We are just collecting materials through the students. It was coming to the Kathmandu University and we are managing those materials. And it basically came as a donation or gift from institutions and, uh, and individuals and artists. So basically general process, you know, because uh, when we started the archive, uh, we didn't just want to collect the material. We wanted to make sure that when the material comes in, we somehow follow a process, you know, we identify those uh, materials, we segregate those materials, you know, we create a basic inventory. So all those sort of generic data as well, we started extracting those based on the materials and the item types and the collection we were getting. So at that point, when students were collecting uh, the materials, mainly the materials were individual materials. They were not coming as a collection, you know, like we were not acquiring any collections. We are not working with any individual collections. We were just getting, you know, item level files, each pages or each photographs or each catalog, you know. So based on that documentation, we were just capturing information and we created a system, how we are gonna create the level of arrangements and how we can make it accessible to the public at the same time or the students or the faculty member. The, uh, there was a danger because if we keep on collecting material and if you don't manage it at the same time, uh, what will eventually happen is you'll have a backlog of materials and which never will be accessed and it has to be managed at the same time. So we assigned students. So I basically worked with the st students and we created the level of arrangements, how we are creating we, how we are accessioning the, the materials. So basically we are trying to understand the funds, we are trying to know the series, sub-series, object and the item level and the components. We're looking at all those factors as we got the materials and over the, you know, each session, uh, students will be engaged with us for like three months and within that three months period of time, they were assigned to do all this uh, documentation. So basically, it was very, uh, you know, as per the archival guidelines or the standards, it was a basic standard we kind of uh, followed to kind of document the materials and, uh, and extract the materials uh, details. So with, uh, to start with, you know, we, uh, we were a very, very new institution uh, who, who was archiving this sort of materials. So obviously we had to kind of rely on Excel sheets. We had no softwares, uh, no software installed within the university. So we had to rely on the Excel sheets. So whatever uh, metadata we could actually extract from the objects, we were just collecting on Excel sheet. So all these Excel sheets, it's not the complete Excel sheet, but each Excel sheet has got about uh, 20 to 25 uh, fields where students will capture all sort of informations based on the objects they have collected over the period of three months time. So each year students were coming to the university and they were collecting materials and they were actually capturing all these informations. So at that time, you know, by this process, we are collecting uh, the physical materials and we are also digitizing. So we have a digital archive also we have a physical archive. So the both of the collection was managed, being managed at the same time. So the student were managing and I was overviewing it and reviewing those uh, documents. So this is basically a general process how we uh, captured the metadata from each of the objects that was coming to the university. So each of the objects were documented, each of the photographs were you know, recorded. It has its own accession number. So the unique, because it was a unique access in the numbering system and people can find it easily. So all these forms also allowed uh, students to kind of um, uh, 
at the finding aids. For example, it could be the categories, it could be the keywords, you know, all sort of all those sort of text and annotation were added in these documents. So we had created, you know, we created about 100, 150 uh, folders uh, of different institutions and different individuals and artists, and they can actually be accessed at the moment at the Kathmandu University. So it is also accessible for the students, the faculty members, and whoever wants to come to the, the university and access these materials. So from next year onwards, because what I've seen over the last three years is we have collected items in an uh, you know, uh, materials in an item level. It was basically very random materials came from different artists. They were not connecting with each other. So within this three, four years time, all this material has come together to Kathmandu University and it start, started to make sense, you know? So all these materials were coming and now we are creating uh, a different level of uh, arrangement, which will basically justify the materials what we have within the collection. So the fonts will remain as an artist and the series could be drawings, you know, the newspaper clippings or the articles, sub series will be within uh, that series, whatever it could fall within that uh, series and the file level and the item level. So we started kind of putting them in a hierarchy level and then we start, we will start documenting in, in uh, this, uh, this process. So at the moment, uh, uh, what I'm doing uh, at the Nepal Architecture Archive is uh, basically based on the, you know, several trainings and the phases we have done with the archive consultancy uh, agency in Delhi, the ECA resources, and based on the, uh, the arrangement levels and the, and, the, and the process they have taught, which is I'm trying to replicate within the Kathmandu University. Basically, the idea will be the same. Here we, at the Nepal Architecture Archive, we document architects and scholars. And whereas in the Kathmandu University, we'll be more working more with institution and, uh, and uh, individuals and artists. So it's, it's basically the same concept and the new level of the arrangements will actually work better uh, in the current context. So this will be the ideal uh, kind of uh, look of an archive we want to achieve. But at the moment, we are basically relying on uh, folders, you know. Uh, but over the period of time, I think uh, you know this is one of the uh, one of the challenges all these new institutions, you know, all these archives will face. Basically, storage is a is a very big challenge and. Uh, and it, 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 it grows over the period of time. So uh, what we have done at the moment, I think it is, it is, it is a very acceptable start for the Kathmandu University. And uh, over the period of time, uh, we, will, we, will, uh, we will change the way we store and manage uh, our documents and the materials. But at the moment, it's basic uh, you know, arrangement uh, if you look at the location wise, and it's, it's a very standard way of storing materials. Uh, and one of the reasons we are doing in this way is we don't have uh, a huge number of unpublished materials. It's basically we are relying on the published materials and the materials they are scattered around Kathmandu uh, and different artists and individuals. So we're trying to gather them together and then bring it to the Kathmandu University so that the students can actually use these resources. Um, so this, this basically this level of arrangement, at the moment the students are able to find the materials, uh, they will be able to access the materials and over the period of time, uh, we feel that this will grow year by year. Um, every uh, folders are assigned a location and they have a location, you know, base and shelf and folders so people can uh, easily find these materials, even though it's a very you know, analog kind of system. We have to rely on Excel sheets. There is no such, you know, Google search bar in a way to find the materials. But at the moment, the amount of materials we have collected is not that huge. And the students are able to find what they want to find within the archive. Um, so there are lots of uh, 
you know, a few challenges we have seen over the, uh, over the last uh, three years. One is definitely the material collection, uh, because if we want to kind of coin ourselves as an archive, uh, we need to have some sort of uniqueness within our collection. I think that will take a time for us to achieve. At the moment, it's very uh, basic. We have got published material. It's basically a collection of documents in one place where we're trying to make it accessible. Uh, stories is definitely a challenging uh, part. We are storing all these materials within the library. The way library works and the, the way archive works is totally different. Uh, basically, library people can go and pull out any documents like the archive, we should not allow uh, practically. So that is something we need to uh, manage over the period of time. Database, as I said, like we are relying on Excel sheets, we definitely want to update our system and then go into a digital platform where people, you know, where all the, uh, all the accession material can sync uh, online and offline. Uh, conservation is another major issue. If we start getting lots of, you know, uh, unpublished materials or original materials, uh, none of us are actually trained to look after uh, any of uh, any, you know, damaged or conservation required materials. Uh, access wise, as I said, like, uh, you know, unless we go on a database system, uh, we will not be able to go online. I think that is something we need to uh, figure out how we do it. And that's where I think uh, Asian Art Archive can support us or guide us uh, in, in, in many ways. And on-site access is definitely, uh, at the moment, it's not actually publicized too much. So at the moment, it's only uh, for the students and faculty member or whoever uh, are visiting within the Kathmandu University. But um, in future, obviously, we want to make this accessible uh, to, the, to the art and culture related audience or any of those who are actually willing to uh, kind of uh, know the Nepali art history and other materials. Um, so that's, that's all basically. So as, as I, uh, you know, as we are a very new archive, I don't have uh, lots of materials or lots of stories or lots of, uh, uh, you know, recurated materials to kind of share with you guys. But at the moment, I'm just sharing what we are doing and how we are planning to expand this archive and take it to the next level. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Samira. Uh, I think uh, I've just taken 15 minutes. <laughs> thank you so much, Roshan. Uh, I think we can hand the floor over to uh, Samina now. Thank you, Samira, um, and thank you for organizing all of this. Um, it's wonderful to be here and share my research here. Um, so let me just share my screen, and I would just start with a little bit of a context for this project. Um, so this is from 2016 when I returned to Pakistan after completing my PhD um, from Virginia Commonwealth University. And um, Hamad Nasser, who was the head of the research at Asia Art Archive, um, approached me and he asked me if I was interested in a project. Um, and so basically we started out as a pilot project just to try out you know, what we can find. And I knew Hamad, um, as like a curator from Green Cardamom, but then also, you know, when I was doing my PhD research, every now and then, you know, um, places I would go and I would, uh, uh, people would ask me, do you know Hamad Nasser? I'm like, yes. And they would, oh, he has already seen this material. So it, this is like, you know, when I'm reaching out for archives. And then the other name, which just like, you know, came up back and forth was like Nada Raza. Um, anyways, when Hamad reached me and he, he approached me and he said, like, you know, here's this project, you know, do you think that you would be interested? And of course, um, I was very much interested because, um, A, that, you know, when I was doing my research, uh, my soul, like, you know, a lot of people helped, like, you know, but uh, Mrs. Hashmi that we call um, uh, 
um, we don't call her Salima Hashmi, we call her Mrs. Hashmi because she was my teacher as well, uh, principal of NCA. And so she was my resource person in Pakistan. Every time I had any glitch, any issue that, you know, how do I deal with like, you know, going and reaching out to different libraries or people or private collections. Uh, she was my point person. There were other people, there was Madam Nazi Shatawla and many more who also helped. Um, but uh, Mrs. Hashmi actually had lived through all those times and she was very resourceful and knowledgeable. Even today, like, you know, if I have any question that I just want a quick answer, I just like, you know, text her on WhatsApp and I immediately get the answer back. So of course, you know, I knew that, you know, this would be a very important thing to do. So um, I said, yes, and this was in 2016. And since then, you know, um, we're working on this project. And I just have to say, I want to share a few um, things with you. So first of all, like, you know, when we started out this project, um, I um, encountered, I was uh, called in, um, in um, Hong Kong, I was trained how to digitize, how to like, you know, really look at what resolution and, you know, there were other things that, you know, was already part of my training as a researcher, like, you know, while I was doing my PhD research. But I just have to say that I was very lucky to get an incredible support from Asia Archive Hong Kong in terms of technical support, but then also like, you know, um, a lot of brainstorming things that, you know, um, I was able to do before like really embarking on this project. So before I start anything, you know, I just want to first um, say that, you know, why Salima Hashmi and why Salima Hashmi's archive. So it's very difficult to introduce Mrs. Hashmi on in such a short time because she wears so many hats and she has this multifaceted uh, career, like, you know, where she has been a teacher, an artist, a curator, a human rights activist, um, um, and, um, you know, an actor as well, you know, she also performed in, on Pakistan national TV. Um, she's a key figure in pushing um, art in Pakistan, and she's like this huge treasure for Pakistani art. Um, she was writing at a time when we didn't have many people write. Um, we don't have any art historians, I would say, like, you know, people may disagree, but, you know, a lot of things um, that we inherited or we came as art history to us was not really written by trained art historians. So Mrs. Hashmi started to write like in 1980s. So, so I had to like, you know, establish, and then of course coming that she was coming from this background where she's the daughter of this very well-known poet, Fez Ahmed Fez. She was already bringing that, you know, um, a lot of inheritance of, you know, um, uh, art. And so, when we started the pilot project, our first phase were really looking at like, you know, what she inherited from her father and then, you know, what was she looking at while she was, you know, young and, you know, the, so this really mostly comprised of like exhibition catalogs, you know, the ephemeral material that we could just get our hands on. Um, there were photographs, there were like, you know, um, newspaper clippings, and this is how we started out. And I wanted to share like, you know, the, the team that we um, sort of put together, but let me say that, you know, when we started out organizing how we are going to start this project, because I think this is always very important, like, you know, when you are looking through somebody's archive, what are we looking at? So having that personal connection uh, with Mrs. Hashmi as her student, as somebody who has learned a lot throughout my, you know, artistic career, I knew her really well. And I knew that, you know, all these sides of her that, you know, she's a writer, she's a curator, she is um, an artist and, you know, um, a human activist. So I think having that knowledge was very helpful. And so I teamed up with the Asia Art Archive Hong Kong and we sort of, first of all, drafted like, you know, tree like structure. So how are we going to organize files? What are we looking at? What are the kind of careers that we are, you know? So if you see on the left side, um, when you open, when you go to Asia Art Archive website, you look at these um, various uh, sort of categories that we developed. So there were writings that we were thinking about uh, that Mrs. Hashmi must have written, um, which I was aware of. And then, you know, so then um, I also conducted a number of interviews with her. Also her uh, person as an artist, like, you know, that was also something that we were uh, looking at. And this all sort of like, 
um, unraveled itself, like, you know, over the time when we finished the pilot project. So it wasn't like, you know, when I started out, I exactly knew what I was doing. You know, I really started out with very light sort of like, okay, so there are like, you know, these boxes in Mrs. Hashmi's gallery. So what are in these boxes? So it just said like interesting things like, you know, writing. And I have to um, acknowledge a fellow co colleague who's no more with us, um, late Sarah Sheikh, who was uh, working with Mrs. Hashmi in her gallery for many years. And she was the one who was like, who started to organize things uh, before I came to look for these things. So when we started uh, this project, I actually asked three of my graduate students that you're looking at the screen. So left to right, um, it's Noman. Um, and then there's Nabiha, there's Ammar, and here's myself. And we started out really in a humble sort of setting in my house. Um, Ishad Archive sent me the digitization sta sta uh, station. And um, of course, I was called in and I got some training from there. And then, you know, I came back and I helped um, with them to set up the station in the house. So we sort of like, you know, this is these are some of the fun pictures. This is very recent from the you know, phase third. So right now we are in uh, phase three of Salima Hashmi's archive, um, where we are like, really, I will tell you exactly like, you know, so phase one was um, us looking into her, what she inherited from her father or what she experienced when she was a young uh, lady, um, going to the exhibitions, what was the art scene at that time. And it was of a particular interest to me because my research for my PhD was modern art of Pakistan. And I was specifically looking at um, the time period from 1947 to 57. So that phase one had a lot of things like exhibition cards and stuff that, you know, um, we don't have any places in Pakistan where somebody would save these things. So this really had to come from this personal archive. And phase two was <clears throat> the stage when we started to like really spread out our research and started to look at uh, Mrs. Hashmi's role as an art educator. So we were looking at what were the kind of things, materials she was using, her slides, and you know her also her own work as well. And then also we were looking at, um, so I'm just kind of giving you a glimpse of like, you know, when we find things, what is the state of the physical state of these archives and you know, what do we do with them? So we take them out, we, you know, um, spread them out, categorize them. So these baskets like, you know, are something that we have used so much. And I was just laughing, looking at um, Russian's uh, slide where he had given the ideal archive, what it should look like. And then, you know, the folders, because I could just completely relate to that, um, you know, folders idea, because that's what we were doing. Um, so sifting through this material uh, really kind of dictated itself, like, you know, what are we going to and how are we going to categorize them? And we just would keep record of like, you know, what are we finding? Is this substantial amount to make it as a category? So we also started to find her, um, you know, so this is about her teaching. So I'm sharing some slides from there. Um, these are the books that she has like, you know, uh, uh, written up notes about her art education. So Mrs. Hashmi actually studied at NCA from 1960 to 62, and then she went on to study um, in England at, at to Bath Academy. And then she did her um, uh, master's in art education from Rhode Island School of Art. And recently she has been um, awarded PhD, honorary PhD from Bath University um, of Art. And so we were like really looking through everything uh, that she had saved from her teaching days, from her student days. So there are notes with what she was studying then. And then also like, you know, uh, things that, you know, she was like her lesson plans and her syllabus. This is really happening. This is third stage where we have started to come to know that, you know, okay, there are also these things which exist. So when I showed you these um, sort of situation of things that, you know, how we found them and, you know, even though they were, um, organized um, somewhat, uh, but of course not everything was, you know, together. So, you know, we, we keep getting surprises. So we're done with like, you know, finding few writings and then we come across more writings. So this is, this is something, a process that, you know, we just like um, go day by day and, you know, um, sorting them and then, you know, organizing them how we do it. So 
in terms of, for example, for her artworks, like I uh, realized that so we, we found the slides and we categorized them like, you know, decade wise, like, you know, the kind of works she was doing uh, in what year we printed those slides out. So I actually had to send the slides to Hong Kong um, to be scanned there because we didn't have any means to resource, um, you know, any resources here to scan them. So I had to print them out and sit with Mrs. Hashmi and go over a lot of these work, like figuring out the dates and titles and sometimes the, the sizes of the works because um, of course the time that she had made the work, this was not really a, a very uh, common thing to document all those things. So this is just an, as an example of like, you know, how there was like, you know, not really a lot of things don't have the record, like even in terms of artwork. So we were lucky to have Mrs. Hashmi around so we could just like ask her take things to her, print them out and, you know, go over them like, okay, so which time period is this coming from? And, you know, um, so for Mrs. Hashmi's writing, we <clears throat> uh, found many unpublished uh, write-ups uh, from her um, archive. And then we also found like a lot of like, you know, uh, writings that were published, but they were just also like notes. And then we also found newspaper clippings. So now we're, I'm talking about the stage three where we started to look for like, you know, we already had some clippings from phase two where we found Mrs. Hashmi has done some writings and we started to gather them. Um, Mrs. Hashmi didn't really had a record of like all this bibliography that the amount she has written. So she was also um, a co-curator for Rota's gallery. Um, I'm sorry, I think I accidentally closed it. <clears throat> So let me just take you here. So this was Rota's Gallery Islamabad, which was run from 1981 till like 2004. Um, she was the co-curator for that. Um, she um, ran this gallery for with the name Pasha and had uh, held over 100, uh, 110 exhibitions there. So all of this material was really coming from like, you know, um, her archives that, you know, you would find. And, and this is exactly when she said, like she started to write about art before that she wasn't writing. Although I did find one writing that she emailed me that was from 1960s, something that she had written in her student days in England. Um, but this is really the time period where we started to write. And it was very interesting to build the, um, Art, I mean, the record of these exhibition histories. So um, this was really helpful for us. Um, then finding um, the kind of things that we found in her archive was like, you know, so there are writings which are unpublished. There are also writings which are published by Mrs. Hashmi on various artists, but then we also find many clippings, many um, newspaper which were by different uh, writers writing on various uh, artist of Pakistan. And then there were various um, artists who were also writing on Mrs. Hashmi's work. So there were like, you know, all these three, four categories that, you know, we started to um, <clears throat> find out. So for me, what was really interesting and important for like, you know, um, documenting this archive was that, you know, for myself being going through this, um, you know, tedious research when I'm doing my PhD is like, you know, how do I get access to this material? what exhibition happened when. And, you know, especially in the context of South Asia, I think especially in terms of Pakistan, I could say for Nepal and Bangladesh, the same thing. It's very hard to find the material of its like, you know, early formative years. And for us to have such kind of access or to these material, these are the kind of archives that really helps us to understand what was really happening at that time. So like, you know, various kind of things. So of course, Mrs. Hashmi was very active um, as, a, you know, um, an activist and then, you know, a big promoter for women artists. So a women manifesto, which was, you know, uh, drafted out in 1983. This is the original of that manifesto that we just scanned. Um, and then, you know, things like that you would come across that, you know, an exhibition of etchings of Goya um, you know, the exhibition came to Pakistan in 1956 and it was like shown in Lahore. And then you find this German artist work that's been shown in 1959. And what was really interesting was to find these little handwritten notes on top of that, because most of these exhibition catalogs or pamphlets or leaflets don't have any dates on them. 
So any time that Mrs. Hashmi has gone to certain kind of exhibitions, she has written some notes. I think the other day I just exchanged something with her. This was a note, um, um, handwritten note by um, Sayyid Ali Imam, one of the modernist artists who was part of my research. And he actually had sent this um, pamphlet to uh, Faz Ahmed Faz. And we found this in the archive. And this is like, he's personally inviting Faz Saab. So, you know, finding something like this, like recent German graphic art, this is like exhibition that happened in Pakistan in 1957 and 58, Rembrandt's uh, reproduction of prints. And this was the conversation I had like, you know, two days ago with Mrs. Hashmi, I just sent her this picture and I said, you recognize this writing, is this you or Faz Saab? And she said, this is me when I was in class ninth. And it says a very good exhibition. So I thought like, you know, these are like all wonderful sort of like, you know, things that you look at. So then I find these kind of newspaper, which I don't think I will ever find it in any of these online resources. This was an article written by um, somebody, but for me, the most interesting part was this um, caricature sketch of Mrs. Hashmi, which is done by another of my teacher, Afshar Malik, who's a printmaker. And his name is being used here, like, you know, Afsharu. Uh, that was the name that he um, he would go by when he was like working for the newspaper. So I mean, all of these wonderful discoveries that you know you would make um, as a researcher going through these, but it has to be like you know um, 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 a fashion that you know you would do something a project like this because I mean there is so much of work involved in this and. And speaking of like annotations, when Roshan was mentioning that, like, you know, I wanted to just share that, you know, we have a very tedious way of like, you know, um, recording and annotating these things, uh, which Asia Art Archive has its own way of like, you know, organizing them, which I really appreciate. Um, so if you get a chance and you go um, on the website of Asia Art Archive, you will see how easily it just, is, you know, it's very um, user friendly. You can navigate through things very easily. And I think that's all from my side. And, you know, I look forward to answer your questions during the um, presentation, I'm, I'm sorry, Q&A. Thanks Thank so you. much, Samina. Thank you. Uh, now we can hand it over to Shimon. Is it okay, Samira? Yes. Okay. Uh, you could see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen and hear you as well. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. And it's really, really nice to hear from Roshanda and Samina Iqbal. Uh, but uh, I have a very different experience with Joiner Archive. Uh, I started from my uh, practicing ground and then entered in the archive. So I'll start. Uh, it's uh, just, you know, you know all, but uh, it's a very short introduction about Janil Abidina. He was the uh, pioneer figure of our modern art movement and he established our art institution, modern art institution. Uh, he actually, he was a cultural activist um, and he participated uh, through his life with this kind of cultural movement and uh, he established the uh, Folk Art Museum in Bangladesh. And there are lots of activities like that. Actually, Jana Labidin, uh, the wife of Jana Labidin, is the main to arrange all this kind of archival material of Jana Archive uh, because she uh, preserves this kind of archival material all the years. Uh, and there are so many <clears throat> materials here. So it's really, very uh, interesting how uh, a single person keep this kind of huge 
uh, archival material and handle this uh, with single handedly. Uh, but uh, uh, Janil Abidin's youngest son, Manuel Abidin, mm -hmm. uh, he has been digitalizing the archival materials uh, since 1940. It's a going on process of developing the Janil's archive. And actually now he is the key person of uh, Janul Archive and he is very interested to uh, develop this and he encourages the young generation to, uh, to work with the archive and, uh, and basically the research-based work with the archival material of Janul Abidin. And actually he encourages us very much. And Mitubai, hopefully Mitubai is in the audience. Uh, he will join with us in the conversation later. And uh, I in, involved with the uh, Janul archive in a very casual, uh, in a very casual manner. I'm not, uh, I'm not targeting that. Okay, now I will go to Mitubai and doing and involved with the archive and doing all the arrangement and something like that. But I was planning to, uh, I was planning to make an art project of mine and, um, and I'm interested about the text and the archival material. And actually I started my, this kind of journey from Shanti Niketan uh, uh, where I did my masters and uh, when I joined as a faculty member uh, at Dhaka University, then I think, and then, then I started it uh, very seriously. Okay, now I have to do something and something like that. So, so in 2014, uh, Joinul Birth Century was celebrated, and I um, I prepared a uh, research paper. Uh, for a seminar and through this I have a good communication with uh, Manuel Bhai and in 2015 suddenly Manuel Bhai uh, told me that uh, uh, please uh, take this pen drive I scanned some of Abidin's um, uh, documents so you could use it as a reference materials uh, uh, but uh, when I was uh, exploring the whole uh, materials I found that there are a lot, lot of, uh, lot of documents, but uh, they are not well organized. So this is the fact. But uh, but my first focus was uh, to relate the archival material with my personal art project. And uh, at this stage, I uh, wanted to focus on the archival photos, uh, basically uh, as a uh, reference as a image reference of my painting or my artwork. Uh, but after that, uh, day by day, I was involving with the archival or with the other kind of archival material, the letters, the newspaper articles, and more. And uh, and <clears throat> during my journey, uh, this material also created some ideas of my artwork also. So this is a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting exchange with the uh, John Ull archive of my artistic practice. Uh, but uh, in 2018, I felt that, okay, this is a good time to share my experience with the audience and, uh, and uh, took a feedback from them and how uh, how they feel or, or, or how they react. Uh, so in 2018, the, uh, my project A to Z Joinul was exhibited in the Joinul Gallery in the Faculty of Fine Art. So actually I uh, want to uh, call it as a submission, not uh, a typical kind of mainstream exhibition because uh, I displayed in a very casual manner, manner and uh, I 
uh, want to relate my master's uh, submission in Shanti Niketan, uh, which was uh, in the outdoor space and not uh, so much uh, gallery oriented <coughs> display policy. So uh, in an institutional environment, I uh, displayed uh, my exhibition. Uh, here I mentioned that uh, Jainul basically is very well known uh, as an artist of Femin of uh, 43. And when I want to focus uh, this point, uh, I explored uh, some very interesting uh, document, especially the uh, conversation between Janul Abidin and Chitta Prashad. And uh, it uh, looks very interesting uh, how Chitta Prashad uh, narrated uh, Janul Abidin. He wrote uh, about Janul Abidin uh, in the People, People's World magazine. And, and they had conversation through the letters. And this is a letter uh, from 1945. Uh, and this very interesting conversation between Jainul and Chitta Prashad uh, through this letter. And Chitta Prashad wrote this from Mumbai. Uh, Jainul uh, then was in Calcutta. Uh, this is the exhibition view. And actually, I had a very interesting uh, conversation with my students and with my colleagues and the critics and uh, and they suggest me that but i also feel that my whole journey is not reflected in the uh, exhibition the exhibition is not good enough to share my whole journey and archiving my journey with the uh, Jainul archive. So that's why uh, after that I'm planning to uh, make a book with uh, make a book uh, about my experience. And in 2019, uh, it was published. Uh, you could see Arship Kumar. Uh, he was my teacher in Shantini Ketan. He visited uh, in uh, Jainul festival that year. So Actually, uh, there are so many, uh, so many, uh, so many points of Janul archive, and uh, we didn't see so much uh, oil painting of Janul within uh, from the early stage or, or the uh, very uh, realistic kind of or the representational kind of uh, oil painting of Janul. But uh, <clears throat> Mithu, bhai, uh, Mithu bhai found this uh, recently. So this kind of work that uh, which was not published anywhere in the uh, Mithu bhai's collection. And the sketchbooks are very interesting because uh, through this sketchbook, we could uh, realize the Jainul's journey, how he developed his uh, uh, style, how he encountered uh, uh, modernism, especially in 1951 when Jainul visited uh, State School of Art as a uh, student. Uh, there is the two pages of his sketchbook uh, in the uh, upper right hand side. Uh, you could see the uh, Jainul's uh, trying to develop a uh, uh, develop a, a personal uh, style uh, with the reference of our folk art, the folk doll, and something like that, and the very much uh, uh, Eastern quality of uh, the line. And in the lower part, you could see that the Jainul is trying to uh, trying to explore the how Cubism <clears throat> was developed or something like that. So. Uh, this kind of sketchbook or this kind of notes uh, really, uh, really helps us to realize uh, his journey uh, through the modernism of uh, uh, how he uh, developed his style. Uh, there is a handwritten text of John Wool, a lot of uh, uh, this kind of handwritten text and uh, uh, there are uh, there are 
the document of uh, as a travel diary or um, actually this text is uh, John is uh, writing a quote from Abhinindranath Tagore uh, and there are so many handwritten texts and Janul was planning to uh, make some class notes for the students, the basic design course or something like that. So there are so many handwritten texts of Janul Abedin in the archive. And there is uh, so many in that, uh, uh, in a uh, typewriter composed text. And especially uh, through this kind of text, uh, John will prepare this kind of text for delivering any speech uh, uh, in some place or something like that. But uh, the vision of John Abidin, his artistic vision, uh, his, uh, his uh, cultural vision uh, are actually came um, this really very uh, interesting to uh, read this kind of text because uh, uh, this text also reflects the uh, the inner side or the philosophical side of Janil Abidin. And uh, <clears throat> it's um, another section of the archive. Uh, Janil uh, collected or uh, the artist of uh, different countries gifted Janil Abidin uh artworks so you could see there is a japanese prince there is a um, turkish artist hassan kaptan uh, uh, he was the kid when uh, joinul met uh, hassan kaptan uh, hassan kaptan's artwork you could see the shumnathur sprint and abdurama chukta sprint also uh, Janul was a, a very big collector of our folk art uh, he's not uh, using only the form of folk art in his painting, but uh, he was really seriously uh, try to uh, try to deal with the issue of folk art, and that's why Joinul uh, was uh, trying to establish a folk art museum from uh, early 60s actually, and finally he could uh, he could manage it uh, in 19. Uh, 75 uh, 74 actually so so this uh, kind of collection are a huge number in the uh, archive uh, these are the art materials and tools of Janu Abidin uh, this is a very interesting uh, book uh, I will end this uh, book my presentation uh, this is a book uh, which uh, was dedicated to uh, Janul Abidin and Jahanar Abidin on the occasion of their uh, uh, marriage, actually. The intellectual um, people, the writer, the artist of Kolkata and the Janul friends of Kolkata, they published it on the occasion of Janul marriage. So I think that this book not only uh, not only represent a personal uh, life event of Janil Abidin, it also uh, reflects the also reflects the cultural environment of uh, 1940s actually uh, how uh, how the intellect how the intellectual people how the writers and the artists uh, working collaboratively and how they uh, reflect their intellectual input uh, uh, as a gift of a friend marriage anniversary. So it looks very interesting. Uh, it, it is not a personal issue of Janil Abidin. I think it's a uh, historical, uh, historical research issue of uh, our uh, subcontinent in 40s. So actually we are very initial stage, uh, initial stage uh, from uh, developing an archive point of view uh, because we are not uh, we are not in phase one two three. I think we uh, we will start our initial. I uh, will start our uh, level one uh, this year actually uh, through this foundation because uh, you know uh, developing this kind of archive. Uh, is very uh, crucial uh, or manage personally is very crucial. So we are 
trying to develop a team and hopefully join Rabinil Foundation uh, will institutionalize this archive and uh, organize the archive in more uh, methodical way and make policies uh, how um, the archive matches will be shared and further uh, initiatives will be taken and hopefully Mitubai will join later with us in the conversation and i think i could finish within time so thank you samira hey thanks a lot shimon yeah well i think now we can move uh, into the discussion and i actually want to start with a really crucial question that's come up from our audiences uh, from petra beck who's asked how do you decide what is in the archive and what is not what is the difference between archival materials and non-archival materials? And Samin, I see that you've kind of addressed it, but I think we can kind of unpack it further. How do you decide what goes into the archive? So I think maybe we can start uh, with asking you, Roshan and Sujan, uh, what is it that kind of goes into your archive? So basically when you, you know, especially within the archive environment, what you have within archive are unique materials basically unpublished documents and unpublished material could be from an institution or personal collection. Right? When I was saying non-archival material, they, they could be other materials than a paper material or, a, or a something that you can easily archive. You know, for example, a sculpture. So if, if someone donates a sculpture to the university, can that really be an archival material? Probably not. It needs a completely different environment to store it and make it accessible to the public, right? So most of the time, archival materials are unpublished document, documents which are actually keep, kept in a certain environment and certain arrangements. So that's why I was looking at archival and non-archival materials, because when you look at the Kathmandu University case, like every year, students finish their, you know, studies and they go away. But during their time, they produce lots of artworks, sculptures, materials, you know, objects, crafts, where do they go? You know, it has to be somehow managed it. So those sort of materials, I call it an unarchival, non-archival material. So that is how I have kind of differentiated the two distinct type of material. Uh, and Shimon, how do you think you've been thinking about this question in context of uh, Zainal Abedin's archive? Mm, it's a very critical question for me uh, in this initial stage, but uh, we didn't decide it actually. Uh, this one will go in the archive because uh, physically all the materials are kept in uh, Mitubai's house at now. So, you know, uh, a normal house environment is not suitable for uh, the archival material or something like that. Uh, you have to create that environment. So in this initial stage, we, it's really very difficult for us to, actually it's really very difficult for me to uh, categorize this that um, we will, uh, we will store this material in the archival section and not archival section. So I think we have to decide or we have to make a policy about this. So, uh, Samina, perhaps you could also elaborate a little more because you've been, especially through the different phases of the project. And I think a crucial question is uh, in terms of also situating the materials with broader histories, with broader questions, perhaps you could address that. Uh, Samina, I think you're on mute. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Okay, so one way of like, you know, really um, um, talking about this is like, you know, I will give you an example. So like, you know, before I started like really my, you know, studies, you know, you go to exhibition, you pick up these catalogs and you just come home and you just toss them somewhere, right? So Mrs. Hashmi, somebody who's like, you know, who has kept all these, you know, and put them in the record. So I think it was her like, you know, um, 
the vision that she could see that this would be someday be you know valuable for somebody so you know considering that the age that we are living now where like you know click of, click of a button takes us everywhere you know so going to like um, you know using those interlibrary loan researches and you know all these resources like you know living abroad like when i was in the us finding a book which was in in india or like netherlands or wherever you know it was it's not difficult at all but i think the the question is like you know finding these kind of things which have not been documented like you know which where really it actually comes from your training like you know so if you're looking for something so for me like you know when i have the access to mrs hashmi's archive like you know i just like tediously so um when i introduce my team like you know there's nabiha there's noman there's amar they're all you know uh, they all have studied they're art students you know they have already graduated they teach in universities and different schools and so for them um a lot of these things they don't understand in terms of like because their research is not oriented towards that era that phase but then you know having that understanding that you know what this means like you know i know that one of them goes to study further and you know start researching they would suddenly realize like how important this was not that i'm saying they don't realize now but i mean they don't understand like you know what is the importance in that sense that a researcher would understand so i think having that you know so what is archival is like you know how russian was saying like whatever is like unpublished or i would say which has not been in public access i would say that so a lot of things that you know for example what i am digitizing right now in third phase of mrs hashmi's archive is the, these newspaper cuttings um you know which have been already published but i know that there is no way i can find that specific article if i even go to that newspaper's website and you know i just like you know bang my head on libraries and whatever but you know this is something that you know and then asia archive kind of organizations like you know i'm saying this because this is my platform where i am doing this is this huge resource because every time so now when i'm preparing any presentation doing any papers doing any research i click something and then asia art archive suddenly comes and then i realize i have already scanned this document and i don't remember because there are like hundreds of things that we have scanned but there are a lot of other things which other people have scanned and they are on the website so what i'm trying to say is that you know to assess like what is archival really comes from like you know the the interest of the researcher the one who are involved in doing the, these things and this can be very subjective so this is what i'm trying to say i was trying to avoid the word subjective but you know yes i mean that's what i would say yeah thanks i mean i think that what what's really important about this question is that it raises how much effort is put in not only in archiving materials but just into thinking about this decision about what go, what is really an archive and what will constitute this archive like thinking about it conceptually as well as technically so i think it's a good question to kind of begin but um i think that would lead me to another question that i have for all of you which has come up in our conversations before is about the pace of archiving or what we jokingly called in our informal meeting archive time uh mm -hmm. and i wonder about how your idea of it has changed from when you started working with these materials and now so i would say how do you look at the same materials differently as uh time passes and maybe we can start with you samina so are you uh, so let me understand your question so are you asking like how do i look at the material now in terms of like versus when I, say versus when you began or and also the idea about how you might have thought this this how much time this would take when you had started and how that right. changed gradually as you immersed yourself in the material right. so the so the practicality of it so like you know the first like you know we were kind of intimidated uh, myself and the team like you know setting up a digitization state station was like you know okay and then you know we're getting these approvals are we doing it right you know the scanning resolution and all of that so first i want to talk about the technical aspect of it so the second phase is like you know so once you're done with scanning so then you get a hang of it like you know how quickly you can just be done with the scanning so i was sharing in the other meeting that you know we have scanned like 1500 pages in like one week and amar one of the um, you know our team member he's responsible for the scanning so nabiha and i would sift through things we would separate them we sort them we put them out we have the fourth member who will help us set up the station so the scanning goes really quickly because it's like really one page after the other but the real task is like how do you record them how do you annotate them how do you organize them i think that is something 
right now we're quite overwhelmed because with this third stage we have digged out a lot <clears throat> so for us the task is like you know so many pages and you know so the organization and all of that takes a lot more time but i think like i said for me the convenience for this project was because we started out as a pilot project for the first phase it kind of gotten easy as we progressed because phase 2 was easier than the first one we were much more clearer in our direction so now in the third phase we already have those organized files you know all we need to do is like yes we find these snippets here and there sometimes mrs hashmi would put like some article that she had found and tucked away in one of the book that she had not published um and so she would take it out and she would leave it on our table with a small note okay i just found this you know so we scan this but we know where it's going so i think with the time it just become easier as you immerse yourself more into the process um and 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 i think again i will repeat passion has to do with this you know um it cannot be done as a job because one has to be really involved in this in terms of like you know what you are doing so i think all of us who are here like you know roshan and shoman and you know so so our interest is because of our personal you know research um i would say that uh thank, thank you, you samina and actually shumon maybe since you have been very intensively engaging with uh, zainul abidin's archive from your student days i'm curious about how how it has kind of evolved over time and how how you got immersed with the archive over time and did you really expect for it to be such a kind of long standing uh, connection and engagement mm, actually uh, it's uh it has been developing over the years uh when i was a student uh, the 90th uh, birth anniversary was celebrated of janul abidin and that was the first time uh i uh, i encountered uh, a huge number of janul's artwork that time and a good publication was published uh, on that occasion so was uh, since then i was just wondering how how i will uh, explore the all the materials of jainul and after 10 years when uh, his birth century was uh, celebrated uh, through that occasion i was more involved with the jainul abidin issues and uh, mitubai is a big uh, mitubai is a big um, uh, a big issue here because uh, he single handedly uh, digitizing uh, this kind of uh, materials um, and uh, you know uh, it uh, it uh, needs time to explore all the materials um, uh, i also i already mentioned that uh initially uh, initially i couldn't um, see all the materials but uh, mitu bhai uh, gave me all those but i couldn't go through with the all uh, i was very selective then but after my exhibition uh, i i was thinking very seriously uh, with the whole uh, with the whole archive and uh, after that uh, we are uh, we are uh, we are developing uh the materials uh, i uh, for uh, example uh, i read a letter of janul abidin then i ask mitu bhai mitu bhai uh, uh, there is a letter from uh, from this person but uh, janul uh, wrote anything to him or you you uh, you uh, you could find this kind of document okay then then mitu bhai uh, mitu bhai uh stars uh, mitwai starting to uh, find okay uh, is there any letter something like that so the this is the developing process uh, from our end actually uh, 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 because uh, mitwai is a businessman now i am doing my teaching and my research because my research issue is not uh, about journal abidin uh, actually uh, uh, poly socio political conscious artist of 80s so i i'm not fully engaged with the archive this time but uh, but uh, uh, in future my plan is uh, i will involve full with my full effort with the archive actually so 
this how it's developing <laughs> not uh, uh, much a professional way uh, uh, how uh, samina iqbal uh, is developing the selima hashmi's archive or uh, roshanda developing uh, roshanda developing the kathmandu university fine art archive uh, but uh, our uh, our archive need uh, an institutional actually an institutional uh, platform uh, and some uh, voluntary service from the young people so hopefully we could um, arrange it within this year uh, actually um, uh, for the covid situation we lost one year uh, we we planned it uh, uh, last year but uh, we couldn't um, start our journey that time yeah thanks i mean it's interesting yeah. because uh, yeah. like you were showing these folders and you were showing this ideal archive so how people kind of receive archives is in this organized institutionalized fashion but then when you really delve into the process you realize it's kind of a long and meandering road um, with lots of different kind of contingencies that are part of it um i think that there's a question that different audience members are asking and perhaps we can address it in a more detailed way uh, especially since you all are educators as well uh which is how do you connect this archive or the research that you're doing with these archives in teaching and learning processes uh roshan perhaps you could go into it a bit more deeper i mean sujan has answered it but uh or sujan you as well in the sense how is it really impacting the students is it uh in terms of their artistic style their art historical research I think it's uh, you know to start with uh, you know if you look at the size of the archive it's not a huge archive right and the material we have is basically scattered material it's a uh, it's even though it's from the same uh forms or a maker or a creator uh most of the document it doesn't Uh, relate straight away we need to find a way how we can actually connect those materials with one another and the whole idea of collecting materials all kind of random materials is actually the base of connecting all these missing dots you know and that could be through uh the catalogs that could be through the newspaper clippings or that could be through any other form of uh you know information that we may have gathered uh by the students effort so i think for now it might be a little bit difficult for the student to kind of get an overall idea about how they can use the archive and take it to the next level but having said that you know as uh, samina previously mentioned also most of the archival materials or most of the the you know documents and informations are actually in a printed form which is just lying in cupboards you know drawers and under beds <laughs> kind of thing right so those are the materials we just trying to access and bring it to the to the university so that you know students will have better opportunity to understand these individuals because if you you know even now i think if you google any of the after nepalese artists you'll find very few materials for these individuals and scholars or artists so what is the other way of finding information so for us via this you know the support of students bringing these materials within the kathmandu university premises keeping them in the library you know managing it sorting it accessioning it that is the only way you can make it accessible to the future generation or the future students you know uh, i think the one generation of people need to do a hard work right then only the next generation can actually enjoy the information they have collected i think we are in that phase you know this generation of students will be working very hard to collect these materials and informations from different individuals and scholars and without that effort i don't think the kathmandu university would be able to ma make it happen i think it's all down to the students who are actually making it happen for us 
And when they collect these materials, obviously they will find different ideas. Obviously they will find different materials, you know. Uh, as Samina has mentioned, like you find an old catalog and there is a note by this maker or the person who actually owns that catalog. And that is the important details we can extract in future. And that is something we can link it in the future with something else that we receive from that person's archive. So I think in overall, you know, uh, the materials uh, type, the materials uh, nature, the materials, you know, age, that is not important to us at the moment. You know, I mentioned about archival and non-archival materials, that is also not important. The idea is to collect material and bring it within the Kathmandu University's archive so that we can sort it out, we can make it accessible to people. And so that the next generation of story, you know, students can re-narrate uh, the story, what we have collected. So that is the basic idea. I think that is how I look at the archive at the moment. It's a very, very slow process at the moment. You know, we have mainly, me personally, you know, I'm very much focused on collecting materials. The stories that we can capture from the materials, that is down to the faculty members who are teaching art history or the paintings or the sculpture or different departments. And I think they will slowly understand that, the, you know, the depth of the materials, the importance of the materials. And then that, uh, you know, narration will come out through the students again, through the researchers, or through anybody who can actually access these archives. So that is, that is how I actually see uh, the, the collection, what we are trying to grow within, within the Kathmandu University. Sure, and I think that is what is Wait, quite specific. Can I add something, Samira, would they? Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, I'll add on uh, what uh, Roshan has just said. No? One, of the, one of the key features that we also realized was uh, going to different artists, senior artists' place and talking to them was also a chance to connect with the senior artists. You know? Whereas like we have very less, uh, we are not that fortunate in South Asia that we have a contemporary art galleries where students can go and visit. You know? So the whole process has been very, very enlightening for our students also to look at how our senior artists have struggled during their time. You know? So it's also, also uh, some kind of paying respect to the artists. And even the artists find it very encouraging to see youngsters coming to them and talking about their work process and their life events, you know. So uh, that entire process for us was the uh, to collect primary documents and secondary documents for the dissertation process. And uh, when they were doing a dissertation for the final semesters, so they could keep those materials with themselves also. But for us now, uh, the students, not only from our university, but from outside also, you know, even for the PhD resources, they come to our library and find materials there. You know? So that it has become a hub where you can find documents, you know, staying there. You know? As Roshan was saying, we haven't done any kind of curated archive as such, but when we have a graduate program, so when we have a PhD programs, then those kind of forms might come about. You know? But for now, like it's just collecting whatever we find whatever we can collect, whatever we can catalog them. You know? So it's, as said, it's a very initial phase, but also there are different layers of learning opportunity for our students, even for our faculty members, and also for all of us, because since all the materials are scattered around, you know, so Bibliogear project that this mobile library doing in Kathmandu, and those kind of small, small archives that personal arch archivists are doing at their private domain, you know. So uh, for Kathmandu University, since it's an institution and open to all, so we look forward having this as a public venture where people of from any walk of life get drop in and just access to those materials. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I think that what is very specific and kind of unique to this is how it is student led. Uh, and Roshan, it was interesting that you were saying that, you know, the newer generations of students have to be thankful to the older generations of students for kind of what they're setting up for them. Um, I'm aware of the time, so I'm actually going to ask one of a, a very interesting audience question that we have by Naisha Tan, which is, I have a curious question. Do you guys have a routine to keep yourself focused when archiving? Uh, for example, playing a certain album while scanning multiple pages. Samina, maybe you could answer it. How does your research team deal with that? 
So I actually have, um, it's, I just laughed um, because it's really um, very interesting. So for us, what we, because we all three of us work, we have our day job. So what we do is like we dedicate our weekend. So we would either go like a Friday afternoon or Sunday is usually the day that we go. So we already prepare ourselves. So three of us has to coordinate and, you know, figure out a day. And so Sunday usually works out the best for us. And I have to order pizza for them. I have to like, you know, bribe them. Okay, finish this much. And then, you know, we have pizza. And so, I mean, yes, you know, and then we, of course, we play music and, you know, all of that. It's it's a lot of fun. And, you know, I have many photographs, like, you know, when I was sharing this, like when they're hanging and setting up this thing, there's a lot of excitement and, you know, running around just like kindergartners. But then, you know, once the work starts, it, it just becomes quite serious. And And so I think for us to have that focus is really important because, we would work at a stretch of like seven, eight hours altogether one day and then not come for like four days or then, you know, maybe just divide for another two days. One will come and the other will not come. So this is how we sort of do it. A absolutely. You know, one has to really come into that frame of mind to work with these kind of things. Shimon, uh, what do you think is your archive routine to focus? Uh... At this, at this situation, we don't have any certain routine. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mitubai is uh, still exploring. Uh, when Mitubai, uh, when Mitubai is able to find something new, he uh, digitizing it. He send me and okay, now uh, I have a hard disk <laughs> for the archive and. Uh, and I put the document. Um, uh, I have uh, some policies. Okay, this uh, news article. Uh, if there is a news article, I uh, keep it in the news article folder. Uh, if it's a letter, I keep it in the uh, uh, letter folder. So uh, actually, we. Uh, we don't have any certain routine uh, to doing this uh, because you know the uh, in Dhaka the social distancing is uh, continuing and uh, we are planning to work together but uh, uh, because of COVID actually we, uh, we are not able to uh, meet physically so frequently so that's why it's, it's uh, going slowly. At now. <laughs> Yours is more improvisational. But Roshan, you yeah, actually yeah, work yeah. on multiple archives. So I'm actually curious, like how, what would be your kind of routine to focus uh, or cultivate the archive temperament, not only actually among yourselves, but perhaps among students as well? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, very different. Like, for example, like when I work at home with my father's collection, I find it very, very you know, meditative. It's almost like a meditation. You just come in, I come to into my working space and I, I'm just drawn within the materials, you know, and I get my things done. There are no such routine. I don't, I don't have any routine when to go to my archive and then get things done. But whereas when I work at the Nepal Architecture Archive or the Kathmandu University, Obviously, we work in a certain pattern or a certain routine or a certain time frame, right? And I think the key is, as uh, Samina mentioned, it's a passion. You know? If that passion is not there, you will not be able to deal with these materials. I think it has to come from very deep inside. Otherwise, that message will not be able to reach out to your you know, fellow colleagues or the students. You know? And I think that passion is the key to you know, get things done and to enjoy as well. And I think if you don't have that passion or if you don't want to kind of uh, get involved in this process or, or even if you don't want to dust your old documents, you know, it doesn't really help. So I think it's all about uh, engaging with these materials you know, with, with passion and focus. And that's, uh, that brings the enjoyment on its own, I think. Thanks a lot, Rosh. And I think that's a good note for us to kind of wrap up because I'm aware of the time. Uh, I just want to acknowledge, as Shimon has been saying, that Mainul Abedin is with us uh, in the audience and Mrs. Hashmi as well. Um, so just wanted to kind of bring attention to that. Thank you so much for joining us 
today. Uh, and I think we can wrap up. So thank you so much, Roshan, Shujan, Samina, and Shumon for being with us today and for sharing your ideas and experiences with us so generously. And we're really looking forward to continuing these conversations. Uh, and we're actually also looking forward to the next Interarchives conversations, which will be in collaboration with Madan Puraskar Pustakale. Uh, so please stay tuned for more on that. Uh, for our friends in Kathmandu, uh, the mobile library is currently at Bikalpa Arts Center in Pulchok, and it is actually open to visitors from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. on Saturday, so please do visit. Uh, we have around 600 books and reading materials, and you can actually access the catalog online on Librarica. Uh, you can read more about our project on the AAA website, and we also have a Facebook and Instagram page. Uh, before I say bye, I just wanted to say a big thank you to the technical support team for this program. Uh, Susanna, Sam, and Carol, who are behind the Zoom backend. A big thank you to Sharade, uh, Sneha, and Osge for their inputs and support in the program. And finally, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, goodbye for now. And I hope you have a nice evening or day, wherever you are. Thank you, Samira. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you all.